I think one of the first pins to show up on the map was a, someone I didn't know named Jorge um, Zuniga from Crichton University. And he and Gene Peck and Mark Petrakowski are our next speakers. They are the creators of the Cyborg Beast, which has been our workhorse and our most downloaded um, design. And they're going to talk about the research and the work they've been doing. Well, uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm very, very excited to be here. This is almost unreal to be able to see people that we work, you know. We have worked for about a year on this, and now I have the chance to see them here. So it's very, very exciting, and I'm glad to see, to talk to the families and so on. And also uh, explain a little bit of the research we're doing with the, with the cyber beast. So uh, I'm the director, the director of the newly developed uh, Mechanical Hand Innovation Research Lab, and, and the co director of the Human Performance and Biomechanic Laboratory. And our research team, what's doing right now, we're, we're, uh, the purpose of the study we're doing is to examine, is to identify the strength, muscular changes, and functionality of the cyborg beast. And basically, where, uh, where uh, our subjects are children, um, and, um, and we develop these prosthetics for our child, for those children, and you know they try them for a, for a period of five months, and then we see them in the laboratory again for testing. Uh, our secondary objective is to uh, develop a feeding methodology that can be performed at a distance. So, um, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about that in one, just a second. So here's a little uh, descriptive information of the cyber beast. And as, as you can see, we use uh, a, uh, a tensioner system to adjust the tension of the cords. The cords are plastic and so on. We have a balance system that regulates the even distribution of the tension. And also we have the hardware that like can be found anywhere in any hardware st store around the country. And then at the bottom of the hand, we just have Velcro, uh, good old Velcro, uh, in order to uh, feed these prosthetics to the hand of, of, of our patients. So uh, when, when, you know, when we developed this thing, uh, the, the, the purpose was really to develop a, uh, a prosthetic device that had a low cost and is easy, that was easy to use. Also, uh, that had an easy fitting procedure. Um, the other thing we were focused on is that it uh, was easy to uh, assemble. So something that doesn't require any type of, of technical skill. Something that mom and dad could actually fix. Um, the other thing we were focusing on is uh, something that was visually appeal appealing to children. And you know, in the, in the process of developing the cyber beast, uh, before we name it, uh, my son, Jorjito, he's five, he's five years of age, he's a big fan of Transformers. So he said, Daddy, you know, that thing looks like a, like a cyborg beast. And I said, oh, I like that. Uh, and then uh, we decided to call it that. And it, it's something that, you know, uh, most children would like, I suppose. Um, the other aspect was functionality, something that was functional, and we're still working on that. That's a work in progress. And as the, the, as the research team that designed the, the cyber beast, we, we are testing it and making sure that it's something that's actually functional and something that's also safe. So and I'm going to explain this here in a little bit. So back in March, we developed, we got IRB approval, and I don't have to explain what that means, uh, IRB approval, but it, for the scientists writing here with us, you guys understand the challenges of getting an IRB approval to work with children, not only children, but children with some sort of disability, with a new biomedical device. <laughs> so that took us about four months to get that passed through our institutional review board. Uh, we had to 
including a research team, or an orthopedic surgeon, the top of orthopedic surgeon in the state of Nebraska, and also a, a pediatrician, because they, you know, they check all the work we're doing. So, the, in, order, in order to be eligible for the study, and we're still looking for subjects in the state of Nebraska, so far we have 12 children, we have approval to do 50. Uh, it's very broad, it's very broad. So we get children as young as three years of age and uh, adults as old as 50. So they will be eligible. And also we have, uh, if they're missing uh, one finger or a number of fingers and so on, uh, is that, that's also okay. Uh, we, uh, we try to know what we not to work with, pa with patients that have some sort of skin sensitivity or allergic reaction to the Velcro or some, some stuff like that. Um, so to move on, as I said, we have 12 children. Nine of them are actually local. The other children are, you were experimenting with doing this at a distance. So, and that's, uh, as you can see, it's a very challenging matter. Um, as I said again, and you know, the university lawyers <laughs> made me put this statement right here that the study was approved at the Great University Research. Uh, as you can see, it has a lot of legal implications, um, as, as we learned from uh, the Hanger representative. So let me explain a little bit about the methods, about what are we exactly doing. So I'm gonna give you a summary of what we're exactly doing. The first thing we do when the children get to the laboratory, we took extensive anthropometric measurements. So we, ta we take length, circumferences, width of the forearm and the hand, both affected and not affected. That's very important. We also take, you know, range of motion, ulnar deviation, radial deviation, extension and flexion. And this is done by a, a trained occupational therapist. The next thing we do, we take pictures of, the, of their limbs. Uh, and we developed this format where they take a uh, few pictures, one of them is fully, with the hands fully extended and flexed, and then a, a top view of, those, of, of, of their limbs, both of them, starting from the elbow and, uh, and showing the entire hand. Um, we, we use a imaging software program to measure every little, you know, all the measurements that were done uh, by uh, in the laboratory, so we, we do we do that. We also take oh, this is, is a figure from a paper we submitted recently to the Biomedical Central Research Note. So it's going to be published here in, in, in the next two months, where we sort of validated all the measurements were taken on the in the pictures. Uh, we validated them done with the with the actual anthropometric measures that are taken in the laboratory. And, and I'm going to show you some results later on because I know the, the scientists here when I say I want to see numbers, I'll show you some numbers. Just give me some time. Give me some time. I have to explain certain things a little bit. The, the idea of taking pictures, you know, and trying to publish this is to get, is to make it accessible to everybody. Other research institutions, educational institutions that are interested in do some type of work at a distance, which is very, very, very challenging. We also take a three-dimensional scan of the upper limbs. We chose the cheapest 3D scanner in the market because we figure if we make the cheapest 3D scanner in the market work, everybody else will do the same thing, right? So we use this type of model of, and, we, and that's the type of resolution we get. So you have a defected hand there, so very detailed. And the rest of the measurements we do is a lot of measurements related to muscle function because really, so what is the benefit of this plastic hand? We develop this plastic hand, we want to know what are the benefits? How can the children benefit? Okay, we know that may, we have learned that self-esteem is very important and they gain with that, right? But uh, for the functionality aspect and the physiological aspects, what are the benefits? So what we're doing, we're measuring uh, the strengths and muscle activation of the flexor, extensors, and so on. We also are measuring uh, ultrasound pictures. We're taking ultrasound pictures so we can see the morphology changes of the flexors and extensors of the wrist. Uh, we have several functionality, functionality measurements that I'm going to show you here in a second. 
So uh, I'm going to have our OT explaining a little bit about the functionality measurements we're doing, but so far we're using the Fugu Mayor uh, as one of, of the functional testing, and we're going to explain this a little bit. And we're use, also using the famous box and block test that we have found very, very useful. Okay, so here I'm going to show you some numbers here. So look, uh, there's a, a table here with individual information. This is something expected, uh, by the way, it's very early on in the study. So the subjects right now are coming to their second visit. So they have used the prosthetic hand for about five, six months. And just now, I mean, last week, we collected some data, so we're not done yet. So this is very early to show you some type of results. So. But basically what we see here is like the, the range of motion. As expected, and this is nothing very fascinating, but you know, I can, I can show you as expected, yeah, the non-affected hand is gonna have a different range of motion than the affected hand. It's not, it's not rocket science. I mean, it, you, you would expect those changes. But I wanted to show you some numbers. And then you can see here the, the same thing for radial and ulnar deviation. Yeah, the affected hand is performing differently with, with less range of motion than the affected, than the non-affected. Strength, here are some values for strength of the muscles, flexors and extensors. The same thing, basically the affected hand is weaker than the non-affected hand. That's just, those are things you would expect. So what are we gonna do about this? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a little picture so you know how we did this the strength testing for flexion and, and extension. So what we have there is we isolated the forearm of the, of the child, and then we asked them to extend maximally, and with a small dynamometer, we measured the force development during extension and flexion. Now you gotta keep in mind that uh, the cyber bees and all the enabled devices, right now, most of them, work with wrist extension, I mean flexion. So basically to activate the fingers and hold an object, you have to flex. So most of the changes we would expect to be from the flexors, right? That would make sense, right? So I'm gonna show you some other stuff. Oh, here are the results from the picture. So we took all the measurements done on the laboratory by a, by a, by a trainer occupational therapist and compare those to the ones we got from the pictures and uh, we there's no significant difference it's the same very very similar which is great which is great because we could use those measurements to develop the prosthetic at a distance which does, does a step a huge step forward by the way we also I'm going to show you some results of a survey we gave to the families and the children that participated in our study. And here you can see, by the way, and in the survey is not validated. It's not validated, so if you want something that's validated, that's not it. Uh, and we will work and validate this, this questionnaire and survey as soon as we can. What we have here is just to show you the usage. So when you, the families are asked, how long do, they, do their child use this this prosthetic device, they said, 75% said, within one to two hours, right? Uh, when you ask them about the, the quality of life, some of them, most of them said that it's very small. The improvements in quality of life are very, very small. You would expect that because children with a uni a unilateral differences, they are highly functional and they have very little issues with the quality of life, so that you would expect that. But, and then the activities that they perform with the cyber bees and, you know, the one that we researched, uh, it shows that 32% of them use it for fun. There's nothing else, there's no specific for fun, because it's fun. 29% uh, uh, at home, 13% in school activities, and only 7% for sports. 7% for sports. So now let me show you a little pictures about the ultrasound because these are kind of, uh, I get very excited when I talk about this thing. So here I'll show you. So the muscles we study, uh, 
uh, for the extensors, we study the extensor digitorium, right? It's a superficial muscle on the forearm. And for the flexors, we study the flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi ulnaris. And here is the measurement of the child before using the cyborg disc. Okay? We measure the thickness, the thickness of the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris. And here it is, 4.8 millimeters. Strength, the strength of the flexion was 18.6 kgs, right? And now let me show you the after. After five months of using the cyborg beast, we have, and uh, the muscles are a little bit thicker. So we, we're at 6.47. Flexion strength is about 26.46 kgs. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Duh, they grow. Kids grow. They will get stronger. Their muscles will get thicker with the cyber beast or without the cyber beast. It doesn't matter. And you know the answer? It's, that's correct. That's right. That's exactly right. But you know what we did? We used the non affected hand as the control. And let me show you what we found there. Looking at the flexor again, six. 6.8 millimeters, strength 19 kgs. After the five months, about seven millimeters. And also, on, you know, we have, they get stronger too with 22.4 kgs. So they both went up. They both went up. So the next question is what's the rate? Because if you would expect increases in strength from the, uh, from the cyborg beast, then the rate would be much higher. So here, let me show you this figure. Uh, look at this. So the red line is the non-affected hand, and the blue line is the affected hand. Did you see how the blue line goes, shoots up at a faster rate? I really, really hope that's because of the cyborg beast. I do not know for sure, but I hope so. And so when I, I analyzed all this data, I got really excited because I said, finally, you know, you can tell people that has a benefit. Devices that, you know, are, are, you know, activated with the wrist flexors have a benefit. And look what I found here. The extensors went up even at a faster rate. Well, things are not making sense now because the, the, the device is driven by the flexors, not the extensors. We put elastics on them, so the flexors don't really work as much. Well, this, and this, this got me a little bit nervous, folks. Uh, when I saw this, I got nervous, because I know I was gonna present here, and I know I'm gonna have very smart folks judging me, uh, judging my data. So, I had a little bit of a question, and I had to go back to the lab and look at some pictures. Let me show you what I found. Okay, once again, here's the problem. Why are the extensors increasing muscle thickness and strength if the prosthetic hand uses the wrist flexors to close the fingers, right? Ah, oh, I think we found it though. We found the solution, I think. Co-contraction. So let, let me explain this, this phenomenon. It's going to take me only a minute. So here's a picture of the actual subject of the uh, uh, doing extension, the strength of extension. This is a picture of the EMG. So you, what you're seeing here, um, oh, this, okay. what you're seeing here in, in the pink is the raw EMG signal of the extensors, and the red line underneath, the red line you see underneath, is the muscle activity of, of the flexors. So when you do extension, the extension are gonna be more activated and the red line, the, flexor, the flexors, are gonna be more, more silent, right? This is the non-affected hand, non-affected hand. Now when you flex, you can see the red line shoots up. A lot of EMG activity. The extensors 
Somehow, somehow. So you see some activity in the extensors, but it's not significant. You see some of it. Once again, this is the non-affected hand. Let me show you the affected hand now. The same thing, when you, they do develop strength, you see activity of the extensors, almost no activity of the flexors. And check this out. This is wrist flexion. You wouldn't tell because they are both activated. We call that co-contraction. Now the underlying physiology of this, I don't know the answer. I can spend some time writing about this, of course. But there is something there that children with upper limb differences are maybe a little bit inefficient when using those muscles that haven't used for a while. So what we're looking, so one of the benefits we're looking at this now with the CyberBees and other, and other enabled devices that are activated with flexion, with the reflection, reflection, is that possibly could give you insight about more controlled st st uh, strategies that may be beneficial. So that's all I have. Uh, the, I'm gonna have uh, our occupational therapist, hand therapist, talking a little bit about um, the functionality of the cyber piece. So here's Gene Peck for you guys. Hi, I'm Jean. I'm the occupational therapist in this group. And because I'm the OT, I guess by law, I'm required to talk about functionality. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, most of these kids are really functional without a prosthetic. So if we're going to put something on their hands, we want to make sure that it's going to benefit them in some way. So in my mind, the goals I was mainly looking at is to increase muscle strength so that when they grow up and they are prepared for a myoelectric device, that they have um, better control of those muscles to use that device. Also, we want to make sure that it's functional for them, that it's going to benefit them in some way. And the third thing, and not the least of all, is the self-esteem. Is it going to make them feel better about um, what they have? So our one um, test that we use to look at functionality is the fugal minor. It's a scale of zero to two, and we do a variety of tasks. Zero being they can't do the task at all, one they can do it, and two they can do it with resistance. Um, so this was a good test for some of our things, um, but we found that it just didn't have a big enough range and we couldn't see a big enough difference with or without the prosthetic. So then we moved to the box and blocks test. In this test, they're given 60 seconds to move as many one-inch blocks as they can from one side to the other. We do it with both the dominant and the non-dominant hand. So as you can see, it's pretty functional with that. And after they get used to using the cyborg bees, we find that they really are getting much better at doing this. Um, so we looked at some other functional activities. Can they hold a bucket? Can they perform gross grasping activities? Um, both for functional activities and um, also we wanted to look at what they can do for play and leisure. Can they use that hand when they're um, with their friends doing fun activities? Um, and as you saw this earlier, just looking at ADLs, are they able to help themselves to be more independent and to do things that were maybe a little bit more difficult before they had the prosthetic? Um, and again, just another functional activity that they can do while using the, the prosthetic. Um, and you know, we look at gross motor and the fine motor. Can they pick up even smaller objects and use it for activities like that? Um, and the other thing, of course, is the self-esteem. How do they feel? Right. And this is a little girl wow. who's three who just got her prosthetic for the first time. You can see how happy she is and how, what a difference that's going to make for her to go to preschool or see her friends and be able to show this off to them. So we have a few challenges with our prosthetic hand, and the one is that they just don't have a lot of strength. We find that they generally have between three and five pounds of grip strength with this hand, and that's not really enough to be terribly functional. Um, so that's one challenge. The other is that um, because of the thumb in one position, we don't have a lot of fine motor control. They can't really manipulate smaller things with it. Um, so this is one thing we've come up with um, just in the last few weeks, and it's an elbow-driven device. So this is great for kids who not only maybe they have, they can't use the wrist-driven device because of the limitation, or they can also use the elbow which has much stronger muscles in the upper arm so that when they contract this they get a much stronger pull in the fingers and carry over with that. So that's a new device that we've just come up with. Um, and also I will let Mark talk about uh, the new thumb that he's developed that has um, 
three positions that allow for more palmar pinch, so it really increases their fine motor skills. So I will turn it over to Mark so he can talk about, oh, one more thing real quick. Uh, this is another thing that I've done with um, just the cyborg thumb, and it's a patient of mine who had a thumb amputation. So I just took the thumb and adapted that. So there's a lot of other functional skills that can be accomplished with using just parts of the cyborg beast. Okay, Mark, I mean it now. So I'm here to talk to you about some of the future plans we have for the research. Um, one of the main things is what you'll see up in this video is that there's a study going on right now that we're in collaboration with, with the cyborg bees being myoelectric. One of the biggest things that we're doing, um, you can see as the fingers are moving based on myoelectric, so we're going to have a myoelectric device here in the future. Another, uh, another cool thing is that this one up here is our all radio deviation device. Um, this one you can flex your pointer and ring finger, or pointer and middle finger with the thumb based on the way how you um, do radial flexion or radial deviation or auto deviation. This is the one that Gene was just talking about, about the movable thumb. There's three different positions. Um, this one is probably one of our newest devices that we have. Um, this was made so that you can have multiple grips, as in the lateral pinch or the tripod pinch, or even all the way over to pinching something small, all the way over to the full ulnar side. And it's super simple. It's just, all it is is a pin um, that can just slide in and out based on a compressed spring, and it takes about two seconds for them to move into a new position. Gene also said, we also had a photo up here um, that Gene showed is also the arm. Again, that's for someone who doesn't have a wrist that can have more of an arm action to device. And these are our five hands that we currently have um, that we have done right now all together in one big picture. But that's not all we have going on. We also have sport lines. So we have different activities, different exercises that I can do. One thing that I also created that I got a NASA grant for was this weightlifting device. This one of the devices has a safety release mechanism, so if you're weightlifting, you can let go of the bar um, and be completely safe. In the works, we also have a swimming hand. We have a bicycle hand as well, too. We have a violin attachment. Um, that was all 3D, this is all 3D printed. Um, and we actually have people actually using our device as well, too. So, Gene has designed this violin hand, and we have created it into 3D printing. And we actually see some people using violins and other instruments. That's not it. One of the biggest things that we're doing is that all of our files are now being released on Fusion 360, so a traditional CAD program. Um, that way that everyone will be able to use them instead of just using the STL files and having to use like blenders and like that or creating your own files. And to finish up, this is our research team here. 